Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this session. The session is titled Using Big Data and AI to Boost Geospatial Insights for Hazard Prediction. My name is Vic Pant, and I'm the Chief Scientist and Chief Science Advisor at Natural Resources Canada. So I want to start by emphasizing the importance of natural resources in the Canadian economy. Directly and indirectly, the natural resources sector account for about 17% of Canada's nominal GDP, about 1.7 million jobs, and even from the export perspective, our exports from the natural resources sector are valued at over $260 billion, comprising just under 50% of total merchandise exports. When we talk about natural resources sectors, we're really talking about energy, mining oil and gas, as well as forestry. So you can imagine that these are very, very important contributors to the success and the prosperity of Canada and Canadians on a global stage. Natural Resources Canada, where I work, is a federal government department, and we are committed to improving the quality of life of Canadians by ensuring that the country's abundant natural resources are developed sustainably, competitively, and inclusively. Now, from the perspective of Natural Resources Canada, we are an economic department, but we are what's called a science-based economic department. So our economic policy and our science are very closely intertwined together. And for those of you that are new to Natural Resources Canada or have not heard about Natural Resources Canada before, uh, you should be aware that Natural Resources Canada is comprised of an ensemble of many agencies and many institutes uh, and institutions. For example, Geological Survey of Canada, which was founded in 1842, is the oldest Canadian scientific institution uh, that's currently in operation. That's a part of NRCAN. The Canadian Forest Service, which was started, uh, which was a part of the Dominion Land Service, which came around in 1873, that's a part of Natural Resources Canada as well. And also Canada Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation, which was started in 1970, is also a part of Natural Resources Canada. So these are scientific institutions that are very deeply tied to Canada's history and a lot of the beyond the horizon science that has come out over the decades uh, from the Canadian government has actually come from these and many other organizations as well. Now, in terms of the impact of our science, as I mentioned, we focus on the natural resources sectors, uh, but because we are a government department and we really focus on open science and open data, uh, we publish our results, we publish our data sets out in the public domain. And you can see that from the perspective of science, about half of our complement of colleagues are actually scientists related to technology, research, and development. And then about half of our operating budget also goes into science and technology research. We publish extensively in the peer-reviewed literature, in the community. We attend conferences. We have posters and workshops. So we really want to get all of the breakthrough science that we are doing out so that other colleagues can also benefit from it and that they can partner with us and really ensure that uh, Canadians are, are, are uh, the benefit to Canadians is maximized through all of the work that goes on in our department. So we are a science-based department, and in our department, there is certainly a lot of the domain science. So of course, when you're talking about the geological survey, you can think about, for example, geologists, geochemists, geophysicists, atmospheric physicists. When you talk about the forestry service, you can think about forestry scientists and experts in, in, in sort of trees and forests and flora and fauna. So that, that's the, the domain science of what our department does, but also increasingly now data is starting to play and has been playing a big role in a lot of those scientific endeavors. So in addition to massive data sets, uh, most of which we generate ourselves, but others that we access through partnerships or that we get through from citizen science channels, uh, these are essentially the reservoir of knowledge that we mine, that we analyze to be able to further the science of our department to benefit Canadians as much as we can. And also data science beyond just the data sets, but actually algorithms and optimization techniques and modern architecture. Some of the things I'll talk about in this presentation are very deeply becoming a part of the science that we do. So domain science coupled with data science is really what has now been leading to some very interesting findings and some very important results that are now informing the economic policy that our department proposes. Now, what are some of the applications of uh, big data and machine learning? So if you look at the previous slide, I mentioned that the impact of the science that we do goes beyond just impacting the natural resources sector. So an example of that uh, is right here. So some applications of big data and machine learning would certainly advantage and provide benefit to the natural resource stakeholders in our country, but actually they have far, far greater ramifications for society as a whole 
are right here. So for example, our geological survey colleagues and our Canadian Center for Mapping and Earth Observation colleagues work a lot on building these systems to simulate the spread of groundwater. Now you can imagine uh, in areas that are afflicted by floods, this can literally be a lifesaver and this can also lead to avoiding catastrophic damage to economic interests as well. If you think about our colleagues in the Canadian Forestry Service using advanced technologies to estimate the spread of wildfires, this can also stave off economic harm, but also for communities that are based in or near forestry areas, uh, this can be something that can be a question of life or death. Modeling energy yields. So where is it that we go and we try to find sources of energy? Uh, that's now all done computationally, or a lot of it is done computationally using some of the advanced techniques that we'll talk about. And also even approximating the infestation of invasive species. This is something our experts at the Canadian Forestry Service look at very closely, is you don't want to have invasive species ravaged through Canadian forests and then really decimate uh, and leave a trail of uh, damage and destruction. So what was not available in the past, for example, large sets of data or advanced algorithms or tooling that folks could use or even the uh, circuitry and the chipsets to run them on, uh, that's all available now. And so really our science has now embraced the notion of digital, of, uh, digital technologies and data science in a very, very proactive and a very foresighted way. Now, what's interesting is, you know, when we think about uh, data science and we think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial neural networks, for a lot of organizations, it's a relatively new area. It's a relatively new capability. Uh, but for us at NRCAN, and I'll show you a couple of examples of this, uh, artificial neural networks are nothing new. Machine learning techniques are nothing new. In fact, here are some examples of peer-reviewed papers that are published that you can find on your own. Um, that these were applications of computer vision, machine learning techniques uh, by Canadian Forestry Service scientists as uh, in the 1990s. You can see, for example, using comparison of possible multispectral classification schemes, uh, optical remote sensing techniques to uh, assess forest inventory and biophysical parameters, method for enhancing tree species proportions from aerial photos. So very, very exciting work that was taking place 25, 30 years ago was already happening. And these kinds of technologies, as they were state of the art at that time, were being applied by our scientists. And not only were they using artificial neural networks and machine learning to do computer vision, but they were also doing sequence learning. Time series data sets were being mined. So for instance, here are a couple of papers uh, that actually look into that uh, from the 1990s by CFS scientists. And this is just a very, very small sampling. You can see that NRCAN has had an expertise in machine learning techniques, deep learning techniques for quite some time. And now for us to have access to even larger data sets and deeper pools of expertise and, and the compute that goes with it, uh, it's something that has really been uh, quite beneficial all the way around. Uh, CFS is one example. Here's an example from the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, another part of NRCAN that I described before. So here you can see a paper from the 1995 titled Neural Network Approach for Geological Mapping Technical Background and Case Study. So all of this to say that for us, we are starting from a deep bench of expertise, of knowledge. And it's not that this research was done only in the 90s or then in the 2000s and then it's kind of stopped. No, we've really forged ahead from that strong foundation. Here are a couple of papers uh, which are much more recent. So still applying lots and lots of uh, data science uh, techniques and approaches on the ever growing and ever varied data sets that our scientists have access to, to really create insights that can benefit Canadians in the long run. And like I said, when you keep in the back of your mind, the kinds of problems you are solving by building these kinds of models, predicting forest fires, spreading, predicting the spread path of, of, of floodwaters, or even predicting the uh, trajectories of, of how uh, inf infestations and invasive species can take over entire areas of forest, uh, these kinds of applications have very, very important uh, contexts or have very important impacts uh, in the livelihoods and the well-beings of, of all Canadians. So one very interesting project I want to share with you, and my reason for doing this talk and, and to talk about these projects is not just to familiarize you with all of the groundbreaking applications of big data and AI technologies that are scientists in various sectors and various institutes within the Natural Resources Canada do, but it's also to uh, invite you to collaborate with us, to consider partnering with us, because as I'll show you, a lot of this is open source, a lot of this is in the public domain, and you can take this to really the next level uh, in partnership with us, or you can do some uh, additional experiments on your own and, and then apply this in your own uh, value chain as well. So this is a very interesting project. It's called GeoDeep Learning, and it's in the broad area of Earth observation. Now, the goal here is the segmentation of satellite imagery to assign land cover classes to pixels. 
Now, in the past, when you used to have uh, aerial photography, you would have people kind of poring over them with different kinds of magnifying glasses and sort of with different ways of, of zooming in and then essentially mapping out this is a woodlot, this is a forestry area, this is a road, this is a water body, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, as you can imagine, one of the uh, applications of machine learning, computer vision, deep learning is actually um, to do this kind of uh, of feature in feature extraction and doing scene segmentation and instance segmentation uh, in satellite imagery. So the approach that we have taken, and this is a work in progress. So like I said, if you're interested in collaborating with us, we are more than happy to consider partnerships is to build an ensemble of artificial neural networks, deep learning networks uh, to do this kind of semantic segmentation, instant segmentation. The problem that most organizations have, which is don't have access to data. We don't have that problem because we, we have access to the uh, downlink stations, the ground stations, and can operate some of them that receive the feeds as they come in off of the satellites that Canada has access to. So we have lots and lots of data that is historical. We have lots and lots of data that comes in uh, on, on an ongoing basis. And we work closely with the Canadian Space Agency to ensure that our scientists have access to these data feeds to build the kinds of models that I'll talk about. Now, what's really cool is the GDL is available publicly on GitHub. So you can actually go to NRCAN slash geo deep learning and, and that's the URLs on the screen now, you can actually access this project. And this is quite well documented and it's quite nicely structured and organized as GitHub projects go. So you can really find some very, very uh, interesting uh, content on this uh, on this uh, web, web page or, or GitHub repository uh, that you can either download yourself and start using it, or you can actually download it to look at the kind of things that we've done and then partner with us and, and help uh, collaborate to take this to the next level. The architecture as it currently stands, and as you can imagine, uh, being adherents of the no free lunch theorem where uh, data science is a game of constant and continual experimentation, uh, we have tested a number of different uh, deep learning model architectures. We've uh, experimented with a number of different types of uh, hyperparameters. Uh, and so what we've posted up there is not sort of the super set of everything that we've uh, got the opportunity to work on, but essentially a representative sample of the kinds of, uh, of, of, of models that we were comfortable putting out on GitHub. Uh, once you have access to this information, of course, you can train all kinds of other uh, computer vision models and then optimize them and tune them in the way that you see fit. So currently what we put out there essentially is a UNet, which is a convolutional neural network architecture, which uses a contrastive and an expansive mechanism to really get into um, to really get into some very, very high fidelity uh, scene segmentation and, and instant segmentation. This was a technique uh, that was originally originated for biomedical imaging uh, and those kinds of use cases. But since then it has actually uh, been used and we've experimented that it actually works quite well uh, when you're using aerial for satellite imagery or aerial photography as well. Uh, we also have Turnaustnet, which uh, takes UNet and builds upon it. Uh, and that's given us some uh, slightly better results. Uh, but really what we're trying to do here is to ensure that our accuracy can go up as much as possible and also minimizing the inference time can go down as much as possible. Because as you can imagine, there are historical data sets that we want to score, but there are also information that's coming in on an ongoing basis from the satellites that if not in real time, we'd like to at least be able to, uh, to, to score on a, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so this is the stuff we've put out there. Uh, these were the, the models that we trained from scratch, the UNet and various variations of it, as well as the Turnaus net. We also did some transfer learning. So we were able to take some pre-trained models and then we were able to freeze the lower layers and unfreeze the upper layers and then retrain those upper layers on our data set. So it really benefited from uh, the kind of um, idiosyncrasies and the peculiarities of our data set. And again, we have DeepLab V3, which is based on ResNet 101. We have a fully convolutional network architecture also uh, related to, uh, to ResNet as one that's out there. So when you download this from, um, from GitHub, you'll actually get to see what our, what our design choices were and essentially how this uh, entire thing was, was put together. Uh, once you download it, you'll also notice aside from the models that I've described, we tested a number of different loss functions. We tried the uh, regular cross entropy. We had the LOVA softmax loss. Uh, we had OHEM cross entropy, and then also we had uh, focal loss. So of course, you know, you, we test uh, the ones that we had access to and, and the time that we had to, uh, to, to test with. But of course, there's many, many other uh, loss functions as well that you can experiment with. And if you get better results, then we're happy to, uh, to, to consider that. And you can certainly submit your insights also through the GitHub 
so that our uh, developers can take that under advisement. Uh, in terms of optimization techniques, we used adaptive moment estimation by in Kingsma. We did uh, regular stochastic gra uh, gradient descent. We had some uh, adaptive bounding time uh, type uh, optimization techniques we used as well. So again, here, if you have different kinds of approaches to optimization that you think can help us sort of reduce the time to train our models and reduce the time to inference uh, later on, uh, based on just uh, how the model is composed, that will be great as well. And I have been included here activation function, transfer functions, but of course that's another set of design choices, hyperbolic tangents and relus and things like that. So you'll see that the code uh, that we have is set up like a, like a harness, sort of like a test bed. So you can actually go ahead and on the right, you'll see uh, the setup of hyperparameters uh, in your own setup. If you decide to experiment with this, you can download this and put this in some kind of a loop and you can do all kinds of um, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, if you don't want to do a, a, a grid search, you can, of course, try more uh, sophisticated approaches such as your genetic algorithms and your uh, gradient-based methods to do hyperparameter tuning, Bayesian techniques. Uh, but the, the code that you'll actually download uh, is, is susceptible for you to be able to, is compatible with you putting in those kinds of harnesses to be able to take this code and, and, and run it through a much, much greater uh, space of, of optimization techniques and algorithms and, 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 and uh, loss functions and such like. And we're very, very excited to see if colleagues partner with us and, and what really that uh, results in. Uh, another very interesting project, which is related to, but is not the same as uh, this, um, uh, this uh, GeoDeep learning project, is what's called the National Air Photo Library. Now, this is a very exciting project because uh, from the 1920s onwards, um, and obviously over time it has become more and more sophisticated and more and more uh, frequent, but the government of Canada has been collecting information or imagery of the surface of, of Canada, of Canada's territory. Uh, and so you can use this in a number of ways. I just described the geo deep learning, which is taking satellite images and you're doing instance detection and scene segmentation to figure out here's where this water body is and here's where a forest is and here's where, where a human development is and so on and so forth. Um, but aside from that, what else can we do? So with, and that satellite imagery that I just talked about with GDL, with National Air Photo Library here, what we've got is uh, we've got from fixed wing aircrafts, from rotary wing aircrafts, from drones, from satellites, we've, we've collected an, uh, sort of a, a large ensemble of about uh, 6 million images. And the goal here is not just to do scene segmentation or instant segmentation at one point in time, but it's to be, because all of these data sets are geo-referenced, it's to be able to then put like for like and put the geo-reference data sets together and over time see how the surface of Canada has changed and has evolved. And now you can already imagine in terms of planning for climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation, this kind of insight can be very, very important. It's good to know at any one point in time where, where's a woodlot and where's a forest and where's a river and where's a lake and where's human development. But if you can see this over time, where's the ice cover? Is it receding? What's all the different other characteristics that we can correlate to the recession and the ice cover? Things like that can really give you some very powerful insights that you can then use to make informed decisions to advise policymakers so that best uh, decisions in the best interest of Canadians can be made sustainably through time. So the goal here is to identify changes to Canada's surface over time by comparing these pixel level changes as we described um, to, uh, from, a, from a time series perspective. So the approach that we are now working on is a time series analysis of aerial imagery using artificial neural networks to calculate the differences. So like I said, classification at one point in time is great, but to be able to compare them over time can give you some longitudinal types of insights, which can be quite uh, beneficial in the long run. Uh, in terms of the database, I mentioned already that uh, we have about 6 million images. And as you can imagine, uh, you know, decades and decades ago, when these photographs were generated, they were generated and printed out on these large sheets that were then used by human experts. And then many of them were com converted into uh, what are called uh, essentially uh, your diapositives, which are, if you think about these transparencies, the slides which you put in those overhead projectors with a bulb underneath, those are basically your diapositives. So we have about 6 million of these paper printouts and diapositives, and about 3 million of them have actually been converted into digital form. High resolution images that are fairly large in terms of their, uh, in terms of their pixel count and in terms of their height and width. So very, very exciting. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have monochromatic images, color images, and in some cases, certain areas also have infrared imagery that you can uh, overlay and superimpose to do all kinds of analysis. 
So now in terms of this, we have about 60% of Canada's landmass covered uh, in some way, shape or form as far as this database is concerned. And then uh, half of this has been already digitized. The other half are being digitized. As you can imagine, there was a multi-criteria decision process that was undertaken to understand which one should be digitized first. And of course, one of the main concerns was the quality of the physical artifact at the time that the decision was being made to ensure that uh, we don't lose um, older documents or documents that perhaps uh, were degrading faster than others. So anyway, this is an ongoing project. And, and like I said, these are georeferenced data points. So very, very conducive to doing all kinds of interesting spatial analysis using neural networks and then overlaying them with a time dimension to really take it to the next level. Now, if you're interested in this kind of a data set, one thing you can certainly do is go to uh, the public website. I've put the link here. It's called the Earth Observation Data Management System. Uh, you can search without creating an account. You can have access to the types of coverage, the dates, and the types of uh, the kinds of imagery that we have available, the source of that imagery, which obviously then has implications about the uh, various technical aspects of those imagery as well. If it's satellite imagery with synthetic aperture radar versus if it's imagery that is from a fixed wing aircraft, that was um, or, or a rotary wing or a drone or something. So you can make design choices uh, from your perspective if you want to uh, take some of this imagery and do some kind of experimentation with it. Or if you want to partner with it, then of course, we're also willing to consider ways in which we can work together to really bring this uh, vision to a reality. But you can go to the Earth Observation Data Management System. You can search our data set. You can look at what we offer. And then you can create an account. And if you're interested, you can engage with us through that. And definitely, I'll be sharing an email address if you want to engage with us from a research perspective, or you want to contribute your expertise in terms of training neural networks, uh, and to be able to take some of these data sets and to be able to derive insights from them, we're more than happy to partner with you. So like I said, you know, uh, I started at the very beginning and I talked about NRCAN and our focus on helping our natural resources sectors. But as I've shown through this presentation, our science has implications and impacts that go far beyond just the natural resources sector. So now that I've given you a couple of examples, you can imagine that uh, the, the neural networks, the models that emerge out of uh, the GeoDeep project or the kinds of time series models and insights that you can, that you can analyze by doing comparisons on, on differences in images, georeferenced images over time from the National Air Photo Library, you can really, really build a knowledge base that can help our policymakers, that can help our first responders, that can help our crit critical response emergency personnel to make mission critical decisions in these kinds of scenarios. Uh, if there's a flood, how is that groundwater going to spread? Uh, if there are wildfires that are breaking out, how are those wildfires expected to, to spread and what, what are some of the uh, risk uh, and the mitigations that go with them? Uh, when you're talking about infestations of, of invasive species, uh, what kind of damage can they have and what sort of uh, trajectory of their spread can we expect? So when we do this kind of science um, with artificial neural networks, with machine learning, with various other kinds of techniques, uh, we're doing them uh, not just so that we can publish papers, we're doing them so that they can be then upstream elements that downstream can be applied into very, very critical functions such as those that are mentioned here. So if you want to work with us on Geo for Good, if you want to apply your expertise, if you have complementary data sets that you think might be able to benefit um, this overall project, then we more than happy to, to consider those kinds of partnerships and um, to get a hold of our team that works on these kinds of beyond the horizon digitalization and AI and data science types initiatives, I'd like to point you to this email address, nrcan.digitalnumerique.rncan at canada.ca. And I very much uh, invite you to consider looking at all of the different science uh, projects that we have going on and think about partnering with us. You can go to the NRCAN website and there's a specific section there called science and data. And on that section for science and data, you can actually see some of the information I've shared with you. You can also have access to the uh, open data sets that we have published out in the public domain. And you can also have uh, some information about not just the GeoDeep Learning and the, uh, and the National Air Photo Library project that I described, but also many, many, many other projects. I certainly uh, didn't have the time to cover all the very exciting data science applications and AI applications that we have uh, at NRCAN in this brief presentation. But like I said, please contact us at this email address. We're more than happy to tell you what other kinds of projects we have going on uh, that you might be able to partner with us on. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take some questions and to receive your feedback. Wow, thanks so much, Vic. That was super insightful and, and all that geospatial uh, information. Just a quick correction. Uh, Vic Pant is Chief 
scientist and science advisor for the Natural Resources Canada. Apologies for that earlier. Um, so going back to um, questions, um, we're open to questions and I believe we've got um, a question here for you, Vic. Um, let's let's get that to you. So what data format um, are these images? Um, can you expand on that and then? Yes. Yes, certainly, Mia. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present to such an excellent audience. Uh, that's a great question. So the way we look at it is our uh, database is actually on this by design separated from the uh, ways in which you can access it. So the idea is that there's multiple different formats, uh, multiple different coding sch schemes, uh, and a lot of them are compressed just given the volume of data that we manage as far as they're stored on the database. But as far as developers are concerned, we have interfaces pretty much that can give you access in any format you want. So whether you want something that looks like a high resolution TIFF file with uh, uh, an XML file that contains all the geo relevant information, whether it's some proprietary kind of geo based file. Uh, so what we do is by design, we keep our data sets separate from the interfaces through which you can access them. As long as you're using some uh, well known or well accepted kind of geospatial uh, tool, then you should be able to get access to our data database. So if you contact us, we're happy to help you. Thank you. And and just um, from from my point of view as a non technical person, I just I'm geeking out on all this geospatial kind of information. And um, we were chatting um, earlier about flood fires and and a uh, flood waters and fires and how you've diversified to COVID. Um, this is so fascinating. Can you just um, tell us from the 1920s to today, you know, how, what have you seen? I mean, that that's so fascinating. I would uh, love to hear. Uh, absolutely, Mia, that's a great question. And you know, one of the interesting things that happened is I talked about two specific projects, uh, the uh, the GOD project, and then I also talked about the uh, National Air Photo Library, but those are just kind of drops in the bucket. There's lots and lots and lots of other very interesting data sets we have related to remote Earth observation and all kinds of other sensor data collected over time, through time. And so what's very interesting is that while their principal purpose, as I described in the talk, is uh, when you talk about predicting sort of the path of floodwaters or predicting the spread of some kind of an invasive species or predicting the spread of forest fires, one of the interesting things that happened is because we had all of this very rich geospatial sort of data and then geospatial models that we could use to derive insights for all kinds of situations like the three examples I just gave. But when COVID-19 came around, and uh, our partners in public health, our partners at Health Canada, even at the provincial level and other municipal levels, when they were looking for a base map, when they were looking for analytics in terms of contact tracing and in terms of where the hotspots for the epidemic are, uh, where the transmissibility is more at risk because of some factor that, for example, public health officials are tracking, they were able to leverage the same infrastructure that I just described in my talk for a COVID, um, for a COVID uh, response scenario as well. So I didn't include the COVID piece because that's a whole another story to tell. But basically, you can imagine that that information that I discussed in my talk with the with the all the models and all of the uh, data sets we have are now in fact very crucial in Canada's uh, whole of government response to uh, to curtailing the spread of COVID nineteen. Great to see that hand in hand tech solution. Um, Mega gratitude for that. That's that's amazing, and I think that's all we've got time for um, today. But thank you so much again, Vic, for joining us. And